This is The Brilliant Brand Show with Justin Keller, helping you fight for brilliance in your branding and marketing. The Brilliant Brand Show is powered by Circle 50 Create. Welcome to today's show. I'm sitting here with my guest, Ryan Booth. I'm so excited to have Ryan with me here today. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So Ryan's a filmmaker, but I love what it says on your website. And this is part of the reason I wanted to interview you today. Ryan's description on his website says, I'm a filmmaker by way of photography, by way of audio engineering, by way of college, by way of Texas. <laughs> Quite a path. Yes. <laughs> so that's one of the things that I love about you. Mm -hmm. Ryan and I met, man, what's it been, five years ago five, now? Yeah, five, five years ago. Five years ago. Mm -hmm. Ryan had just won. It was Canon's uh, contest that they had for the DSLR when they came out with the, what was it, the 7D? It was five, yeah, it was the 7D, I think. Yeah, five or 7D, I can't remember. What was that called, Canon? Uh, it was called Beyond the Still. Uh, and it was, it was what I ended up learning was it's actually an ad campaign uh, that Canon was using big, ad agency, Madison Square, or Madison Avenue, you know, ad agency was putting this campaign together to encourage photographers to pick up a DSLR for video. And so they sponsored a multi-episode, like a multi-chapter uh, short film contest, basically, where you start with a still image, you write your own three-minute short film, and then you end with still image, and whoever wins that chapter, that's the still image that starts the next you know, thing or yeah. whatever. So, yeah, it was, I mean, it was literally aimed at people exactly like me. Because you were a photographer I at was that doing point. Photography. I mean, you had been an audio engineer before that, then a photographer, and you're a really mm -hmm. good photographer, actually. I mean, um, the, so Canon at the time, for those who don't know, I mean, they were moving from, hey, these cameras don't just take still photos, right, they right. now take video. So yeah. the contest was a campaign. Yep. Uh, and, you, and you won. Mm -hmm. um, so I had heard about Ryan being here in the Houston area. But the first thing I saw was this crazy piece you did in Haiti after mm. the earthquake. That was the first time I became aware of you. Uh, interesting, yeah. So remember that piece you had? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was like you were following a kid down. Yep. Uh, do you remember what was it? Yeah, it was. Uh, I was in Haiti after the earthquake. I went five times that year after the big earthquake in 2010, and um, uh, with a couple, there's some great organizations that were doing work there. But yeah, I, uh, we were shooting and this little boy came, he finished, they had just left school and this whole crowd of kids was walking and I ended up following him kind of as he made his way through the rubble basically to go to his home after school. So, but this piece, what it did was you literally just followed the kid through the rubble. It was like yeah. a one shot, it was a one shot thing. Yeah. And I know that's maybe more familiar with people now seeing videos done sure. like that, but at the time, being, you know, video was one of those things at the time that you had to have really expensive gear right. to be able to do it, right? Yeah. And the DSLR thing sort of changed the game a it bit. It did. Um, no, it's a, I mean, it's like a massive moment for sure in terms of, uh, you know, technology providing access to people to, to shoot interesting video. Because at the time, a crappy video camera that did not look great was like seven or $8,000 still. And so these little, you know, still cameras basically like would shoot this really amazing video mm -hmm. and what happened was in about that time a ton of people were like i have this camera i guess i'll shoot video now and and it didn't take long for a ton of photographers to go yeah no i'm a photographer i don't think i'm going to shoot the video but what it did do is for guys like me i was like oh i love photography because i love composition i love image but i'm actually like interested in photography over time um and that's video, you know, it's yep. telling a story through film. So that, for me, it, it provided kind of a very concrete, um, you know, example. Uh, it, it provided me access to something I didn't know yep. I wanted to be doing. Yeah. For me, what it did watching that, and it was at a time when I was leading in a creative team, I was creative director at the time, and we were just moving into that, uh, you know, I'm talking five years ago, right? Yeah. yeah when brands weren't really telling stories with videos a lot or, mm -hmm. or real well. I mean, mm -hmm. like I talked about accessibility to right. equipment. So for me, as a creative director at the time, I saw this piece mm -hmm. and I it, it captivated me. I saw a story in a one single shot, mm -hmm. in a one single scene mm -hmm. of this kid walking and then a simple statement at the end. I saw a story inside of that moment. Mm. And I think it was probably one of the first times I didn't just see someone talking on camera right. and telling their story. Right. Instead, I saw the story through the lens of someone else's life, right. the way they live it. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was captivated. So mm -hmm. 
I remember when I saw that, I thought, I don't know who this guy is. Yeah. I had no clue that you had really not been doing video even at that point. I hadn't, yeah. <laughs> and I remember sitting with you at <laughs> breakfast saying, man, I want to start telling stories with video. Yeah. And you have something. I don't know how to even to describe this, mm. which is still how I feel about you today, your yeah. style. But you've got this. I want that. Mm. Like, I want that in our videos. I want to feel this emotion that you bring. Yeah. Do you think that some of that's, you know, we talk about the different backgrounds. Do you think that your music, audio, background at all, translates to being able to capture emotion through film? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. I think, you know, the, the, the thing that I love about filmmaking is it really is the kind of modern, the kind of quintessential modern art form, in my opinion. It, it's the culmination of a lot of different disciplines. Yep. So you have to be able to write if you want to tell a good story. You have to be able to shoot, you have to know how the camera works, you have to have a concept for how sound works. Um, and then also you have to have a concept for performance and like a kind of a, a deep kind of emotional connection to what's happening in front of you to be able to kind of take all of that later and then go assemble it into a film that makes your viewer feel something. I think that that, that the, the kind of contest, uh, winning the contest for me was the first time that I realized uh, the the prize for the contest was that they flew us all out to Los Angeles to um, and they gave us they actually gave us like three hundred thousand dollars and two days to make like a proper kind of finale chapter. That was of not this prize film. money. That was not prize money. No, no, no. <laughs> that would have been all right. All, right? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have minded that. No, because there were eight of us, and uh, it basically what it meant was that I got to be on a like a proper set. There was like 75 crew running around, a bunch of 18 wheelers full of gear, and I'd never seen that before. And I think in that moment, I realized like, oh, all the things that I love and have been interested in, I've been doing the music thing, I've been doing the photography thing, I've always written, I did theater in college, like, if you take all of that and put it into one place with a bunch of people, it's what I'm seeing right now, which is yep. a film set. So so we're going to talk about storytelling yeah. and using video for your brand to tell the story, mm -hmm. right? Um, and But before we do that, you've come a long way since, uh, <laughs> since you had yeah. to say, yes, I'll work with you because yes, yeah. I need to make a living. <laughs> yeah, I mean, was part, part of you working with me was probably, let's pay some bills, right? Well, I mean, part of it for sure. I mean, what you offered me was a, a long-term contract to make videos, basically. And that for me, at that time, I had a, I had a three-month-old? No. No, my baby wasn't born Not yet. born yet. I'm yeah. sorry. My, my baby was born like my wife was about to burst, you know, and I knew that like I was moving into the next phase of my family life. Yeah. And so um, I also had just seen this kind of like the goal, which was, oh my gosh, the film, like I want to be on set as much as possible. And I remember at the, the rap party, the producer, me and another of the winner director guys were like talking to the producer and we're like, how do we get back here? Yeah. You know, like we want to be back here. And she literally said, like, go home and work for five years um, and, like, keep putting stuff out and eventually it'll be good and we'll bring you back out. Um, and so I think my initial reaction, of course, was, like, no, I meant, like, tomorrow. How do I get back out of here tomorrow? <laughs> right. um, so the idea that, like, this is going to take some time was not, you know, but once I kind of feel like I digested that, um, I knew I just needed yeah. reps, you know, I needed practice and, and I needed to work with good people. And, and so that's what your kind of contract offer provided. And I'm eternally grateful because I, I do think that that kind of like, I needed a bunch of time to make things that people were going to see, but that weren't like, you know, I just needed to turn through like making things and practicing and getting yeah. better. Um, and literally, I'm not kidding. I shot a commercial last fall that was nearly five years to the date, the same Madison Square, or the Mad same Madison Avenue, big, massive ad agency brought me out to shoot, um, I probably can't say the brand because it never <laughs> came out, but they brought me out to do this big commercial, biggest set I've ever been on. Yeah. And I realized, I literally realized like halfway into the production day that the creative, the agency people were the same people from Beyond the Still. So wow. it was like almost five years exactly. And when you were, so, but you, I mean, you put in a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, dude, the content we used to put out mm -hmm. was week in and week out. Like, oh, yeah. And it was, and yep. it was, you shoot it, you edit it, and it's out seen before people in three, four days yep. less sometimes, right? Yep. 
so the pace. But talk about, give people a little bit of background just real quick into what you do now. Yep. And just so they can learn who Ryan Booth is now. Totally. So uh, it's always uh, in flux. <laughs> it probably will always be in flux for my entire life. But I basically um, am primarily a director at this point, which basically uh, in the kind of proper filmmaking world, the kind of commercial world, what that means is um, I work with production companies. Ad agencies are commissioned by their clients to come up with campaigns. They pitch it. Once it's all approved, they go to a production company um, because they don't go to directors. They go to production companies because uh, you know they're about to spend a lot of money. And they the first question is, can you manage a project in which we're going to can you manage a project in which we're going to spend this amount of money? Yeah. And so uh, the production companies are awarded the jobs from these agencies. And then the production companies represent a handful of directors. And they go, Ryan would be great for this one. We're going to put him on this job. And then you start pitching, basically. Um, and you write treatments, which means you ex have to explain to uh, you know, a room full of people, this is how I will take your kind of concept for the brand and how I would approach it yep. nuts and bolts and it could be a 50 or 60 page document that I have to make on a regular basis so that's that so that means you're not even just shooting all the time oh no 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 I, I shoot I shoot a fraction of the time I'm yeah. primarily on the phone um, and second to that I'm mostly writing okay. if I'm not on the phone I'm writing um, I probably write 10,000 words a week. At but you're point. getting to work for some, like, name some of the brands that you've been able to do some work for yeah, now. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I just shot a StubHub commercial, which is really cool. I've done Under Armour stuff. Um, I regularly shoot for Spotify, for Vivo, yeah. um, you know, big brands, which yeah. is really great. So you're doing, what's interesting, though, is this, and I want to just talk for a couple minutes about this and then move into the storytelling side yeah. of it. But what I really appreciate about you, and I always have, is, one, you're willing, mm -hmm. always, like, you know, I think about us having that conversation about, will you come shoot video yeah. for me? There's really no great reason here. The pay wasn't awesome mm -hmm. by any means. Mm -hmm. I look back now and laugh at what, and say, Brian Booth deserved more. But, <laughs> you know, I do. Yeah. Um, but you've been willing, and you've pivoted. Mm -hmm. And so as we talk about helping brands, I think there's a couple sides of it. An organization can learn a lot from even you have a, a true core to who you are, mm -hmm. but you've been able to pivot along the way. Sure. Um, I guess help me t just understand navigating the different opportunities and sort of what got you from here to there. Mm. Maybe some of the winning secrets so that for you to mm. going from us at breakfast to you working with Spotify and Under Armour mm. and brands like that. What do you think it's been the key in the pivots of your life? I mean, the pivot, I mean, while you're pivoting, it feels like you don't know what you're doing and I don't know what's happening. And, you know, I'm, I, I say that because I'm actively pivoting from DPing to directing right now. Mm -hmm. So the first, the storytelling part of filmmaking is incredibly difficult and complex and requires just experience and knowledge about how these little snippets that you have can turn into a story, right? Yeah. That's, that's really difficult, takes time. So for me, I, coming from a photography background, I found that my first handful of opportunities were DP jobs, basically where I work for a director and a producer and I'm, it's my job to execute kind of the vision of the project. Mm. And I found that to be a good fit for me right away because of my photography background. Um, and I had to learn lighting really fast because lighting for film is very different than lighting for photography. Yeah. Um, but I mean, conceptually it's similar. So. I feel like I, I had to do, that's kind of the first thing that I noticed when I started putting films out, um, you know, putting stuff on Vimeo or whatever, I would get calls to, to shoot things for people, not necessarily to direct things for people. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think when I was working with you, I was learning those kind of storytelling chops, but then was getting called out to go do, um, you know, DP stuff. Be a cameraman. Be a shoot, camera guy, go shoot this thing for me. And I would say a, a huge key to those first kind of few years was that I did a thing called Serial Box, which is like a performance video project. Yeah, they're incredible. Um, so uh, uh, speaking of that real quick, yeah. we, you can still watch those, right? Yeah, they're still online. Where, yeah, they're still Where do online. we find those? They're on SerialBoxPresents.com. Okay. Um, and, and basically what it was is taking my audio experience yep. and 
marrying that to my kind of newfound filmmaking experience and bringing in a bunch of filmmakers that I met locally and us kind of shooting these multi-camera performance videos with bands. Yep. And, and they're incredible. It was awesome. And it was not like a, let's figure out how to make money doing this. It was like a, let's make it because we're yeah. like, I didn't, I had an idea for something. And, you know, I mean, the reality is, is that with filmmaking, the scary part is at some point you have an idea in your head and then you then set out to try and bring that idea to bring that into the world. Yeah. And that is a terrifying process no matter what stage of your career you're in. And so part of what I did at the beginning was um, let me get a lot of people around me and see if we can kind of collectively get this idea out, um, which is I'd love to see like a really interesting version of 1990s MTV Unplugged. And the, but I, what I like and I respect about you in in that, and I got to be part of, um, you were working hard for me, mm -hmm. but you're also at the same time pursuing this passion yep. that you have. And I just think that's a, a lot of people just jump ship mm -hmm. toward this thing that they're just crazy in love with. And, and, sure. and you know, I, so I respect you and your pivots. You've been yeah. able to, to know, like, I got to stay focused on this, yep. but I want to move toward this. If you hadn't taken those steps toward one, if you hadn't stayed focused on what was right in front of you, mm -hmm. you would have, you know, some some opportunities. But number two, if you hadn't pursued those yep. that passion part at the same time as being responsible, yeah, you wouldn't be doing some of the things you're doing, yeah. right? Didn't that get make way? If I'm, you correct me if I'm wrong, but shooting your cereal box stuff didn't that make way for you to do some things that you are, are opening up these other doors now? Yeah, that are totally. Happening? I I did, I did. Uh, yeah. There's a really long chain that's it's worth it's it's actually I thought about it the other day just because um, it's not something you can ever like I'm not a person who's like here's my five year plan yep. I'm gonna like work the plan execute the plan and that's not because that's not a valid way of going about things it's just not my personality like I'll never I'm never gonna do that yep. um, but my plan is I'm gonna plant a whole bunch of seeds and like whichever ones start growing, then I'll like, that's where I'm, I'm going to keep working on those. And so I feel like, um, yeah, I did a few cereal box right away cause I knew a bunch of bands. So they trusted me and sure, we'll come in and play a song for you. I don't know. And, um, I got literally within the first six months of doing cereal box, I got a call from, uh, a producer in New York who said, we want our, I'm, I'm a producer of VH1. We want our, reality TV show promos to look like Serial Box. And so I spent the next couple of years doing terrible reality TV promo <laughs> uh, work, but it was multicam, like yeah. interview-based stuff. It looked like Serial Box. And then I got a call at the same time from a producer who said, saw your stuff. We have mutual friends in Texas. I'm in New York. I'm packaging a feature. Would you be interested in DPing a feature? Yeah. Which I didn't know that I was not qualified to do that. So I just said, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, ironically, those two producers were roommates and called me separately from each other, not knowing that like they were both calling oh. me because their third roommate was in a band that I did a zero, zero box with. Mm -hmm. See, so, so it's just like one of those, and I, and I'll give you that. That's even that's a three year old story. The story that's happening in the last year, and the reason I'm directing right now, um, is that I did a serial box for Johnny Swim. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm telling you, they kicked my door down to do a cereal box. I turned them down, I don't know how many times. Their manager was like, no, you don't get it. Like, just please, whatever. I mean, like, they will not let it go. They really want to do it. And I was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. I'm not sure. I don't think so. And I finally said, okay, fine. Like, if they'll stop bothering me, like, we'll, we'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it just to have I'll them stop calling me. I'll just do it so me. you'll stop calling me. <laughs> That's and, not a bad problem to yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, right? no, it's great. Um, and we did it. And of course, the second they walked in the door, I was like, I'm such so an idiot. Did. Yeah, I'm not yeah. like such an idiot that I didn't see this. But um, but anyway, I did a cereal box with them, which then they called and we did, uh, I did a, a handful of music videos for them. And then I got a phone call saying, hey, we're working on this feature documentary idea and would you be interested in maybe directing? I was like, absolutely. And then it morphed. And uh, when I was, last year I was out on a, a great project I was shooting for The Revenant. And um, my, the director of that project was talking to me and he was like, it's time for you to direct. You need to, you gotta By do By the it. way, you said that underneath your breath a little bit, but you were shooting for what? I was, yeah, yeah, I did. So I shot a feature length doc uh, uh, about the making of The Revenant. And that's on your website. 
Yeah, yeah. It is. By the way, can we just stop stop there for a second? Sure. It's incredible. Cool. <laughs> it, it's yeah. inc it's incredible, and you need to go watch it. Mm -hmm. It's ryanbooth.net, and mm -hmm. they can find it on mm -hmm. there um, under the about, I think. Yeah. And, and see some of your work, but having isn't it funny to look and say like, here you are. Did you get to you met people that you didn't think you would meet, right? Oh yeah, t totally. I mean, yeah, no, it's. I mean, it's definitely like. I think um, you know I had a I had a director same director of that project was like you know you need to get comfortable like when you get to meet these people like don't think of them as unattainable idols think about them as like people who are further along the same journey as you so like they're they're mentors even if you don't interact with them regularly they're the guys who like you're trying to because you'd been familiar with Elliot's work, yeah, of course. Right? I mean, like yeah, yeah. I knew Elliot, and and uh, Al Hunter's one of my favorite directors. Chief is one of my favorite DPs, and so Elliot was just saying, like, don't be afraid of the kind of these you, guys. Yep. These are the thing you need to start thinking of them as like you're heading towards this. Th yes, like these 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 guys chose are choosing the same path as you, um, or you're choosing the same path that they've yep. kind of walked down, and so. I found that to be an interesting perspective. But Elliot told me, he's like, make a list of production companies uh, that you would be interested in working with. Because that's mm -hmm. kind of, that's how you move to the next level is working with production yeah. companies. And I made my list and I got a call. Uh, I got an, I literally, I made the list and two weeks later I got an email from the top production company on the list. And they're like, hey, um, I got your name from this guy Abner who's in this band, Johnny Swim. And like we're working with them about maybe doing this documentary thing, and he suggested that we reach out. Um, so literally, the Revenant Opportunity documentary that you did mm -hmm. was connected also to the opportunities from Serial Box. Yeah, like Serial Box. A weird way. Well, the, yeah, the Johnny Swim. Basically, like by doing a Serial Box with Johnny Swim four years ago, which three years started ago, by doing these other Serial Boxes. Totally, and then that led to like a big, big production company reaching out, and I work yeah. with them all the time now. I mean, like regularly, like I'm. I shoot a job. I shoot a job on Monday with them. Yeah. So. So, and that's that's one of those things. I think just you know, part of the community that we speak to through mm -hmm. the show is is I call it like an accidental community mm -hmm. because you fall into something. Yeah. That maybe you have a purpose and a passion for, uh, but the path, like man, you don't always know everything you need to no. in it. And so yeah. I say that to just kind of. I think it's important for brands even to think through like. You can have a core, like everything that you're doing is related to a camera. Sure. N none of those opportunities are separate from that. Right. But none of them look the same. Right. And I think that's been important um, for your career, just mm -hmm. watching from the sidelines and as a friend behind, just saying, this guy's getting these opportunities because he's willing to say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he knows what he wants to do, knows where the end is probably, yep. but willing to say yes to some of these on the way. So totally. I think that's a good takeaway for whether it's an aspiring filmmaker or photographer or uh, a business owner, I mean, yeah. have a core. Yeah. Be willing to say yes. Yep. And you've taken some opportunities that you probably look back now. I mean, you, dude, you shot my wedding. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that this morning. Totally. Like, you've done things for people. Of course. You've been generous. Yeah. And you're getting opportunities that because you deserve them. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I do think that what's interesting is, and this is the part that I don't, I'm navigating right now, and it's very difficult, um, is... At some point, you have a core, and then you have to start saying no. You have to go like, "That's a great opportunity for someone, not for me, though." Like, because everything, I mean, everything at some point, especially as you get older, you have a family. Like, every job is an, has an opportunity cost, right? There's like, if I'm saying yes to this, I'm saying no by default to other things. And in addition, if that job requires travel or requires a lot of kind of intense work around the job, yeah. then you have to say no to a lot of other opportunities or you may be kind of offline for a bit. And I think that like that part where you, I say that as someone who's sitting home, I could be out shooting a job right now that like a year ago, I would have punched myself in the face for saying no yeah. to, but it just didn't like. Opportunity cost. Yes. That's the best. Probably the best way I've heard that said. Yeah. It's, there's an opportunity cost. It costs something yeah, to take every job. And and that's totally fine. It's yep. just something that you've got to, like, Wait. be aware of, you know? So let's do this. So um, so you can learn more about all the details of, like, what you're part of and mm -hmm. the brands you work with. I mean, Ryan's uh, definitely, you're building a resume that's worth um, 
I mean, it carries a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. And you're humble. You're not going to probably brag on yourself like that. So I'll let people, <laughs> let people that. figure this yeah, out yeah. That, if, that, if they're not aware of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and your photography is amazing still. On you know, I show people. I was, with, it was in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh-huh. recently, and this guy had a, a camera. And he was complaining about what the photos he couldn't get to turn out. And he was talking about how much he loves photography. Mm-hmm. What I did, I pulled up Instagram. And nice. I said, you need to follow at Ryan Booth. Yeah. Look at his photos here. Yeah. And he just freaked out. Oh, that's so awesome. You, you, you're super talented, uber talented. But what I want to spend the rest of our time that we have together with is I want to talk a little bit about storytelling with yeah. brands. So one of my things is I think uh, you're noticing, we're all noticing the the increase in video content being used for brands. Yep. Um, and an emphasis on the words, tell your story. Sure. I think that's a very uh, vague statement to make, like mm-hmm. tell your story. So mm-hmm. everyone just starts trying to spew. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of people are actually telling, or I think it's possible to tell the right story, mm-hmm. even in the wrong ways, mm-hmm. or to be telling you know, the wrong story um, with the best platforms, right? right? So let's help people a little bit think through What does storytelling as a brand look like, especially through video? So if I strip this all down to some bare bones and said, what about a story do you think are crucial elements that whether it's video or it's something I read Mm -hmm. that you feel like if every story has these components to it, you feel like that's that's the the base of a good story? I mean, I think the primary, the I view films as empathy machines. They're like, it provides a way for you to truly put yourself in someone else's position, unlike any other art form. Like how so? Uh, I mean, I just think if you can, I think part of the reason that these kind of like very uh, day in the life-y type vibe videos are so popular right now, these doc style videos are so popular, is because we want to see the world from other people's perspectives. I think when we do that, we, it creates great empathy for not just our like us viewing their life, but really I think it allows us to see kind of um, and relate to kind of a bunch of different people that we might not know that we have things in common with. Yeah. So I think I think that's like a way. I think films have a very unique way. It's why a lot of the conversation about diversity right now, in terms of diversity in front of the camera, diversity behind the camera, is so important. Because we all, as uh, human beings, when we get to see the world through other people's eyes, it makes us better people. It makes us Mm -hmm. better and more thoughtful people about not just what other people are going through, but about how we are kind of going about our own lives. Uh, And I think that you know, on the brand side of things, um, you know, I think that that's, that's a critical component is kind of telling stories that feel, and it's a buzzword, the authentic, you know, or whatever, but sure. what people mean by authentic is that it is like a genuine moment. Like this is something that we genuinely are able to offer to people. This is our perspective that nobody else has, right? Yeah. And I think that that, like keeping that in mind and being very intentional about how do we kind of bring forth a story that shows the world from our perspective um, in not a overbearing or this is the only way to do things, but a this is how we see, this is kind of what we bring to the table. This is why we go to work every day. This is why we put in our time and effort to do these things. Um, I think that that people kind of naturally connect to that kind of story. I think that's the DNA that's in movies, television, and even in the best commercials. Mm. So the... Are there any things that um, that we can do as we're trying to tell stories of brands? I mean, myself, even thinking through our company and and, mm-hmm. and doing that for others. Uh, are there things that you you do intentionally to extract that and find the right story? I mean, I I mean that's part of I think that's part of why as a director I spend so much time on the phone. Um, is I do have these very long conference calls with uh, like right now I'm doing a piece uh, with the Houston Grand Opera. And they're about to launch kind of their next three years worth of programming. Um, And so I've been working with them for several months now to kind of figure out what's the best way to launch that initiative. How do we tell people like, I mean, that's huge. Three years of work, like it's impossible to boil that down to a three minute film, you know, but we're trying. And part of the way 
that we've identified how we can best do that to help them tell that story, to help people feel connected to the opera and what they're doing, and to help people who don't necessarily have a lot of experience going to the opera or what the op opera is even, how can they bring people into the yeah. fold? And we've done that by talking a lot, hanging out, hearing, asking questions. I think as a filmmaker, there's no more powerful tool that you have in your tool belt than curiosity yeah. and asking questions. And I think that through those questions and through that time really thinking about kind of what it is that's important to us, what, what are we trying to accomplish, those things kind of rise to the surface. This is a bit of a loaded question, probably mm -hmm. unfair uh -huh. to, you, to ask even maybe, but let's go for it. Uh -huh. um, do you think it's possible for, let's, let's say a brand, I mean, uh, you, and when we talk about most of the brands that we would work with and that, that we're probably speaking to, they're brands that have people connected to them. I think sure. every brand does actually. Sure. If you strip away the product, you mm -hmm. actually you have no product without people. Right. But do you think it's possible for a brand, like you take the Houston Opera that you're working mm -hmm. with there, do you think it's possible for brands to tell their story well with and and the right story without having, you know, someone else extracting no something from? I mean, well, I qualify that. That's why I said it's a loaded question. Yeah, yeah it's but. a loaded question. But I mean, I, I think in the same way that like there are times in which you like you need to talk to a counselor, right? Because right. like you're you've got all this stuff knotted up inside and you're not really sure like what it means. You just know that like you're doing this and like it doesn't feel like yeah. it's working, right? You talk to a counselor who's like able to help tease apart like what's actually going on, what's going on below the surface, what are you trying to accomplish, what are the things that you're doing right now that are keeping you from being able to accomplish that. Yeah. I mean, it's very similar, I think, to you're a neutral third party who comes in and says, like, here's my objective view, and, like, w uh, you know, when you say this, that doesn't really make, that doesn't make sense to me because of what I see. And I think that, like, <laughs> you are, like, a therapist in a way for, in those initial, like, yeah conversations because I think that um, you know that's that's hopefully what the brand is wanting from you is someone who can help you um, kind of identify like some of that that core that you're talking about because I, I don't yeah. know my core I don't know I just know that like when I make something people go I could totally tell you made that I don't know why you know like so if somebody was trying to like identify like, I would need somebody to help me identify what it is that makes a film that I make obviously made by me yeah. you know um so in the same way that like brands are just making things and like the good ones i feel like are making things that feel quite consistent whatever sure. and but i think in terms of how do you talk about that how do you make a film about that you need someone to help extract it i agree i agree completely um by the way watching uh alejandro he said something um he said as a, po a poet doesn't always know uh, a poet knows what he wants to write yeah but after it's written, doesn't always know what he wrote. Yes. And I thought that was brilliant. I feel like that's kind of, you know, you know what you want to write, but once you get through it, it's like, I didn't know that's what I said. And yeah, that's what I totally. wrote. But, um, what, is there any kind of formula that you kind of apply to, all right, if we're going to tell this story for whether it's an opera or if it's a commercial or what, is there any sort of formula from, you know, I need, I need to, they need to say this, we need to make sure we have this part of the story mm. and then this. Is there any, like, if you got these three components to a story? No, I mean, I think it's, it's probably a, broader it's a broader view in my opinion than that even which is um you know the great paradox being the great paradox of storytelling if you want to tell a story that connects to a very broad audience then it needs to be like a, about a very hyper specific detail mm -hmm. because in the specificity if you get very specific about someone's routine let's say you're gonna shoot a film and you like you shoot somebody's like morning routine in that specificity, you might not live in the same house, have the same life situation, you know, it might be the same gender, the same race, the same age, or anything. You might not even have the same job, but in the, the kind of hyper specificity of how do you get going in the morning, how do you, you know, get ready, like you will see yourself in moments throughout that film. See yourself living that moment. Yes. Yeah. And then you connect now you're connected with like what's happening and okay. then you're invested in the kind of like overall goal of the film. So is it safe to say approach a story from the standpoint of make sure you have moments where your audience is going to be able to say, I see me in that moment? Yes. Is that, that, uh, yeah. is that a fair statement? Yeah, totally. Any story without that, it's just like I see them. Totally. And I don't see me. Totally. That's not an effective story. I don't think it is. Yeah. What would be, a couple more questions. One would be, what's some things that you're seeing brands do well 
right now in using video to put their product out there, put their purpose out there. Mm -hmm. And then what would be some things that you see that you think are absolutely, like I can't understand why they're doing this. Yeah. Um, so what are some, some wins and some, some losses in what's happening with brands and video right now? That's a good question. Most of the stuff that I do, I don't work on like massive 30 and 60 second commercials yeah. uh, yet. You, it takes a long time to get to that point or it doesn't always take a long time, but you need a project that gets you into that world. So what I do mostly is branded content and original content. Mm -hmm. So meaning uh, it's basically longer form or you know longer than a 60 second commercial so like this opera piece will probably be six to nine minutes long um, but that's a shift though even in the yeah in totally the, in the industry, so i think right? i think i think some things that I, I appreciate about brands is the idea that it doesn't have to only be a 15 second pre-roll ad i think the idea that yeah. like there is no and maybe this is both this is probably answering both of your questions if it's a good story it doesn't matter if it's two minutes long or I, you can watch a two minute film that feels like it's 30 minutes long. Totally. You can watch a 30 minute film that feels like it was 60 seconds long because the reality is when you watch a 30 minute film, you are not watching a 30 minute film. You're watching consecutive moments, moment, 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 right? Yep. And if the filmmaker is in control of what's happening, and has been intentional and has built this thing well, you will be transported along those moments without going like, wow, it's been yep. 15 minutes. Yeah, so I think totally. that, I think being a rigid, like a rigid, um, you know, attempt at length is like a, it, it, nothing makes me more frustrated um, than like a very, very like, it has to be three minutes long or it has to be under four minutes or it has to be this time. Yeah. And in the same way, I feel like that kind of like commitment to telling the story first, believing that if we tell the story really well, that your kind of brand goals will be embedded within that story. And like, it's, it's scary, but like get out of the way of the good story. That's, uh, what are things that get in, the, just what are maybe one or two things that get in the way of a good story? I mean, I think product is like, you know, uh, but I, I think there's a way to like, what it requires is if you're, if the product is something that you like, you have to sell, right. And it better be a product that like people aren't that familiar with to put it in there. I like cell phone ads are the worst, you know, yeah. it's like, do you think, does anybody think like that we don't know what a cell phone is or, or uh, like we, we all know yeah. what a cell phone does now. Right. So what about the product? Like what is it about the particular thing that you're trying to sell that is tied into the story? So there was a, a for instance, I like talking about product, there was an Apple commercial that came out where they were talking about accessibility. And it was like um, some, I believe it was deaf students. I can't remember, but they basically were showing how the product was enabling them to extend their ability to live their life. Yeah. That is an amazing, like integration of a product, not like, hey, can we have another shot of the guy scrolling on his totally. phone? Like, who cares? Yep. So uh, I think big takeaway would be uh, telling the story. Number one, people need to be able to say that's me. Number two, um, if you're going to put, if you should be able to show the product's benefit by showing pe the result that people have because of it, right? Yes. It's, instead of worrying about you know every other word saying the name of the brand, every you know, is our logo there big enough? Like just show the results that it causes in people's lives. I think that's a shift in storytelling it is, as for a whole sure. for, for brands, right? I mean, it hasn't always been that way. No, and I mean, I think it's a, it's a, a consequence of kind of being, all of us being so much more media savvy. You well, know? You, and you can look up the features. Sure. Like we can find information so easy now. So we're, it's more about connecting me personally. Yep. And, and like you said, I like that point specifically to something. Yes. If it's a product even that affects the way my morning is or just my running like totally. in the morning versus, you know. Totally. Connect specifically. Yep. Last question for you would be this because I know we uh, got to respect the time. But <laughs> so my last question for you would be this would be, is there a brand that I ask everybody, what's their crush right now, their brand crush? Mm. So a brand that you look at, and especially as a photographer, film guy, music guy, you say, I absolutely love this brand. They are magic to me. Mm. Who's your brand crush right now, Ryan? That's a great question. I mean, I would say Samsung. Uh, 
I think f on the film side, they are doing some really interesting mm -hmm. things. Um, they're commissioning really amazing looking commercials, number one, but I just think that like, they've gotten really kind of heavily integrated in the YouTube side of things yeah. as well. And like, I just can't turn around and not see something Samsung, okay. which I think is really interesting. I wouldn't have expected that one to come from you. Yeah, no, I mean, I just yeah. think, I think, you know, that's pretty rad. And then I think for me, I have the great opportunity to work with um, a lot of music brands. So I'm doing a lot of Vivo and Spotify work yeah. and their commitment to like, basically create original content that they go out and find a brand sponsor for, a brand partner for, I think is really cool. Yeah. So that you get to make something interesting with a musician that a brand gets to be kind of tangentially involved. I think yeah. is that's really fun and as that's, a filmmaker. I think that's just what makes why people are crushing on certain brands too, yeah. is because they're just they're seeing the real side of life yeah. now, not just the, the totally. big product. Well, Ryan, thanks a ton for doing the interview today of here. Um, all right, if you want to learn more about Ryan Booth, you can go to ryanbooth.net. Yep. And on Instagram, you can Ryan go Booth. to at Ryan Booth. And I'm telling you, his Instagram feed alone <laughs> <laughs> is like candy, every eye candy every single day. So um, anyway, big shout out to Ryan. Thanks for being a part of this show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hopes everybody. And we'll see you next time on The Brilliant Brand Show. If you would like to have your question featured on the show, just visit circle50.com slash Q&A, and in return, we'll send you a free digital copy of Justin's book, Rebel Brands, 10 New Rules for Building Brilliant Brands. The Brilliant Brands Show is powered by Circle 50 Creative. Find your untold brilliance and make your purpose matter with the right message, visuals, and marketing. Learn more at circle50.com.